Hello, everybody, and welcome to Brands Hatch for the fourth round of the 2012 International GT Open, where it is very, very wet and soggy as we get ready for the seventh race of the season. Good afternoon, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to Brands Hatch for the fourth round of the 2012 International GT Open. This is the first race of the weekend, about to come up, the longer 70-minute race where we have got the mandatory pit stop midway through. And as you can see, it is very damp and drizzly here at Brands Hatch this summer in Britain. It really is the summer that never was. And after the dry qualifying this morning, the heavens opened about an hour ago, and therefore it is very damp on a grid which is headed up by Andrea Montermini, the most successful driver in the history of the International GT Open. He won at the Nürburgring back in May, and he lines up in pole position. Talking to you this afternoon in the country box, it's myself, Ben Evans, and alongside me is the Formula One journalist and blogger, Keith Collentine. Good afternoon, Keith. Good afternoon, Ben, and welcome, everybody, to Brands Hatch, this fantastic 3.7-kilometre circuit in the Kent countryside where the British summer, that's summer in inverted commas, has served up exactly what you would expect and yet more of what you would have seen if you were watching the British Grand Prix from Silverstone a week ago. We've had huge amounts of rain here. However, with about a quarter of an hour before the start of this race, it has stopped raining, so the track's drying out, and that's going to give the drivers some very, very tricky conditions to contend with. And in all probability, at some point in this race, we'll have to make a decision on that also tricky crossover between full wet weather tyres and slicks. That is going to be the challenge for the drivers. Is delighted to see the car of Philip Petter coming to the grid. And Philip, he is due to line up in fourth position. However, that car was involved in an incident in qualifying earlier on, so good to see that is Reef Fettles ready to go. Here is the third place car, and that is Jimmy Bruni, who has already scored two victories this season alongside Federico Lay. He won once at the Nürburgring. He also won the last time out in the 70 minute race at Spa. He'll be looking to put together a good run this weekend as the cars prepare themselves ready for the rolling start that will get this seventh race of the International GT Open season underway. It is a very busy, a very congested grid down there and there in fourth position sorry, is Philip Petter. He and Michael Brosnitsky looking to build on what's currently quite a difficult championship position. They've often had one good race a weekend but then have had problems in others. Well, Michael crashing the car in a damp qualifying session just about two hours ago along the Brabham Strait, and there were certainly concerns that that car wouldn't be ready for the race as it is. The Kessel Racing Team have done a superb job to get that ready, and Philip Petter, vastly experienced driver, and he is certainly going to be a driver to watch in these tricky conditions. Yes, I think there was considerable relief when Brosnitsky was able to pull that car out of the pit wall under his own steam and, uh, and motor back to the pits, and the team realised that they were going to have uh, uh, perhaps an easier job than they first e expected getting the car onto the grid. Well, this is a car that in the second race at Spa never made it to the grid when it went off on the installation lap. And so the Vilwa Racing squad of Matteo Malicelli and Alvaro Barbara, a lot to prove this weekend, but they have been showing very strongly. They're yet to claim a victory in 2012, but today could just be their opportunity to do that. If you're new to the International GT Open, then there are two classes. There's the Super GT class, which is predominantly for GT2 cars with a few tweaks allowed by the championship organisers to keep it as equal as possible within the class and then the GTS class which again is broadly speaking GT3 but with a couple of tweaks as well to assist with equalisation making second appearance of the season then is the Chevrolet Corvette of Dier Derek Shitoff and Nicky Pastrelli Pastrelli making his seasonal debut in the International GT Open one of two Corvettes on the grid the other in the hands of Miguel Ramos and Raffaele Giamaria and showing very nicely in practice earlier on. This is the class leading car then in the GTS class where Michele Rugolo put together a superb performance in qualifying earlier on. And so Rugolo at head of the GTS field and he will be very pleased with that. And certainly in these wet conditions we can expect to see the GTS cars 
uh, running up with the Super GT cars largely because the GTS cars have got the benefit of ABS brakes, which is part of, of the GT3 regulations, whereas the, the Super GT cars don't, which Keith, on an undulating circle with some steep downhill braking zones, could really play into their hands. Exactly, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of uh, tricky braking zone here uh, around a lap of Brands Hatch. Of course, the first one comes up fairly soon as they go uphill into uh, Druid's Bend, the, uh, the hairpin, the tightest and the slowest corner on the track, and then they head out into the countryside where the track is fairly narrow. There's not an enormous amount of runoff in places, and there's some very, very high-speed corners, which in conditions like this, when the track's slippery underneath the wheels of the car, they can't quite feel the grip. They need to head into the braking zones and, and figure out exactly how much speed to screw off. It's going to be very, very tricky for them. But as I say, it, it looks as though conditions are going to improve as the race goes on. And it's going to be a little bit of a voyage of discovery for these drivers because the second of the qualifying system we had earlier on, which sets the grid for tomorrow's race, was hel held in comparable conditions. So they've had a little bit of running, but not an awful lot. Here's Archie Hamilton, who is the grandson of former Le Mans winner Duncan Hamilton. And Archie making his first appearance in the International GT Open this season he's doing the whole season for the Auto Orlando Sports Squad yeah. and has put together some very fine performances not least at the first meeting of the year at the Algarve since then the team just struggled a little bit for pace but they've been going well here at Brands Hatch this weekend which is a circuit that really plays into the, the hands of the Porsche with its arguably superior traction to the Ferrari 458s which often on the straight line section of the circuit and the quicker circuits maybe has the legs over the Porsche for the first time this year we've got a second Auto Orlando Sport Porsche it's in the hands of Matteo Beretta who is making the switch from the European F3 Open this weekend to share the car with Mich Marcello Puglisi and Matteo doing a very fine job in qualifying this morning to get that car to 14th on the grid and he seems to be very relaxed in the cockpit as the team's just passing final instructions to the drivers the grid beginning to clear here and then the race will get underway and as the uh, grid begins to clear and uh, you can see them pulling the tyres off there gradually uh, reveals our front row of Andrea Montemini on the left-hand side in the Ferrari 458, and then on the right we have Nick Tandy in the Porsche 997. Um, those two uh, have obviously won quite a few races already. Montemini's got one race from the Nürburgring. Uh, the Tandy holds a Porsche, has already won three races this year, and despite that, isn't in the lead of the championship. Had a bit of a tangle with uh, Bruni uh, early on in the season. Yeah, that was at the Nürburgring. They line up second. The car we just saw, Michael Dallastella, Watch for that car in the second half of the race when Daniel Zampieri takes over the wheel because Zampieri got the car on the podium out right at Spa last time. He's a very, very rapid driver. And Michael Dallastella is no slouch either. We've got a slightly mixed grid here because we saw red flags interrupting this morning's qualifying session. That means that both drivers in both classes really didn't get the opportunity to get a consistent run going for the 20 minutes that they're in the session. And therefore, interrupted qualifying and a slightly mixed grid. Here, though, is the uh, car of Ramon Narak and Patrick Pile. They are well up in the championship and have been very, very consistent this year. They've not finished outside the top six yet to score a race win, though. But watch for that car as it moves up through the order steadily over the course of the race. It's Ramon Narak who will be starting before handing over to Patrick Pile. The, the car over a race distance is of a comparable pace to the Mantai Porsche of Nick Tandy and Marco Holz, but a very different philosophy from the IMSA Performance Matmut team in terms of the way they really run the race very steadily as the fans just getting themselves into position. It's certainly the, the right weather for a, a warm cup of tea or coffee today. It really is somewhat chilly here, very damp, but British motorsport fans very enthusiastic and they will come out in all weathers to support the International GT Open. You do wonder if that sort of instant switch on performance of the Mante Racing Porsche is really going to help them in the opening phases here with the with the slippery conditions, helping them get the tyres up to temperature more quickly and perhaps uh, attack the Andrea Montermini uh, Ferrari. Well, Nick Tandy, we know, has been very successful here at Brands Hatch over the years. He starts that bright yellow and green car you can see right at the front of your sh shot there. But Marco Holzer, his driving partner, has never raced at Brands Hatch for us. Talking to him yesterday at lunchtime, he was saying that really it was just a case for him of learning the circuit as the pace car heads off from the grid. So we'll get the formation lap underway very shortly here. Andrea Montermini, the former Formula One driver then, who starts in pole position. And after the end of his single seat career, he's gone on to forge a very, very successful career in sports car racing, not least the International GT Open, where he was last year's championship runner-up. That was running with Emanuele Moncini. This year, Juan Manuel Lopez, his driving partner. Lopez, in turn, was fifth in last year's championship. He scored four victories along the way as well. And that was coming on the back of being the Spanish GT champion in 2010. So it's a, a driver lineup with some pedigree, as is the Nick Tandy and Marco Holzlife as the cars head down through Paddock Hill Bend and come up 
the hill towards the tight Druid's hairpin. Which is an overtake opportunity. They come down. It's a very narrow exit from the hairpin down towards Graham Hill Bend. Uh, again, a, a tight left-hander. It, it baits the drivers in thinking they can overtake there. They really can't. It's just one car wide on the way through. And here is the starting grid then with Andrea Montermini in pole position. Nick Tandy alongside him. Jimmy Bruni in the very rapid air, of course, at Ferrari 458 in third. Philip Petter in the Kessel Racing Ferrari in fourth. Matteo Malicelli, the Vilwa Racing. Aston Martin in fifth. And Miguel Ramos in the Chevrolet Corvette in sixth. It's a great qualifying performance there from Miguel. Then it's Diedrich Schittoff in second of the Corvette and Ramon the Rack in eighth position. Michele Rugolo heading up the GTS runners in ninth. And Alexander Taukanitsa, that's Taukanitsa Senior in tenth. Javier Morcio in his Aston Martin lines up in eleventh. And that's his first appearance of the season, Morcio. So we'll see how he goes. We may not have Phil Driver there in 17th because that car in the second qualifying session had a, a fairly hefty incident over at Sterling's with the second driver, John Gore, behind the wheel with their Massimo Mantovani completing this 19 car field. And Keith, they're out on the Grand Prix circuit. It's a section that's track the drivers love, mid-speed challenging corners. Absolutely, and, and a sadly little seen section of track. It's not a, they can't use the full length Grand Prix circuit that often. I think they maybe only have about a dozen uh, broadcast races on it per year. So it's fantastic to get to see uh, you know, thoroughbred cars of this quality tackling the full length Grand Prix circuit. Of course, Brands Hatch, uh, former home of the British Grand Prix, last held the British Grand Prix in 1986. And the, the full 3.7 kilometer track that we're using today is really very little changed from what they've had over some 30 or 40 years ago. There's been a few alterations. Graham Hill Bend's been tightened a couple of corners like Westfield and so on have changed slightly but now here come the cars round for the start yep so the pace car pulls in and they form up in side by side formation ready for the rolling start we always see here in the international GT Open 70 minutes of action about to get underway here on a very damp and drizzly Brands Hatch circuit the lights go green and away we go who's going to get the jump from the lines they surge towards Paddock for the first time it's a start from the front row getting away really pretty much equally so it's going to be Montermini who leads through Paddock Tandy still a little bit wide it's then Bruni in third Philip Petra in fourth with Malicelli in fifth so the top positions unchanged Tandy was trying around the outside there wasn't he on Andrea Montermini he couldn't quite do it he again taking that wide line through Druids they come then downhill towards Graham Hill Ben and looking to the inside Nick Tandy trying to force the issue early on but Andrea Montermini very experienced so he just puts the car slightly to the middle of the road so they head towards Surtees for the first time and will come through that left-hander and out onto the Grand Prix loop everybody cleanly through the opening stages as Archie Hamilton looks to make ground around the outside of Alexander Salkanitsa, the race leaders heading out of Surti and then along towards Pilgrim's Drop, a fast and exhilarating section of the circuit before they turn into Hawthorns and the three leaders keep beginning to break away. Yeah, the top three already starting to get a bit of a gap over Malicelli in fourth place and quite a disciplined start, at least so far, as they uh, head out around this uh, first lap of Brands Hatch. Tandy already beginning to probe Montermini's defences a little bit, but he's going to have to keep an eye on Bruni and his mirrors and we've got to move here uh, for position. But I think it was Ram on the rack, and he's made the place. So Narak in the Imsa Matmut Porsche gaining the place, and that was the car of Stefano Bizzari in the GTS class. He was able to squeeze past. So Narak, although coming back under pressure now into Sterling's from Bizzari, is the leading trio of cars turn into clearways for the first time on to complete the first lap of the race then there's the gap back to Petter in fourth Malicelli in fifth and then it's been a brilliant start from Michele Rugolo he's up into sixth over rules Montermini twitches the car accelerating along the ground straight on towards Paddock Hill Bend Tandy though not quite able to capitalize is everybody going to be cleanly through the end of this first lap yes they are the headlights peeking through the Merck and Rugolo busy defending here from Diederik Chitov and Miguel Ramos so the two Corvettes flying in formation with then Archie Hamilton next in the queue that was an important pass for Narak because the championship co-leader did not make a terrific start. He started eighth, and despite having made that uh, pass, he's only up to 10th place. Montoni looking a little bit tentative, and uh, now as they come out of Graham Hill Bend, you can see Nick Tandy sizing him up for a pass as they come into Turdies. Tandy looking down the inside. Is Montoni going to close the door? He runs a little bit wide. The Manthe Porsche's up the inside. Nick Tandy, Andrea Montoni side by side as they come down Pilgrim's Drop. So here they come, and I think Montermini is going to have enough here because the Ferrari normally a little bit quicker in the straight line. He's got the inside line for Hawthorne's fantastic racing. It's Montermini, though, who's got the inside line. And so the Galorba course, Ferrari holds on in the lead of the race with Nick Tandy. He did everything he could to try and squeeze through, but the outside run through Surtees in the wet. There's often a little bit of grip there with the marbles, and Tandy able to take full advantage. He then runs out over the white line through Pilgrim's Drop up 
through Dingledale, rather, then through Sheen Curve on towards Sterlings. And let's not forget here Jimmy Bruni, because Bruni in third position, he's just sitting there, staying in touch with the leaders. As we see dramas a little bit further back, it's Iraj Alexander looking to the inside of Stefano Bitsari, tapping Bitsari, and around goes Alexander. And he just tags Michael Dallastella as well. Dallastella lucky to retain his rear wing. Alexander should rejoin from there as the leaders come through to complete another lap. I was just saying, Keith, though, Jimmy Bruni in third, perfectly positioned. Absolutely. I think uh, when Dallastella looks back at that replay, he'll realise just how lucky it was. But then once again, as they came onto the start-finish curving sweep, Montermini ever so slightly squiggly in that Ferrari. He's not quite got the full purchase. And the Porsche, as we thought, seems to have very, very good traction, particularly off these slower corners. As they come into Drury's once again, Nick Tandy, you can sense he's building up for another move on Andrea Montermini as they come down the hill now into Graham Hill Bend. Montermini covers the line. Tandy follows in behind him. Is he now going to take a run at him for a second time as they come up into Surtees? Drury maintaining a watching brief he knows if these two take each other off everything is perfectly placed to fall into his position and already Philip Pater now in fourth place has dropped to over 1.8 seconds behind the leading trio yeah and Jimmy Brunny though he's just done the best uh, top speed of anybody in the race as they head out of Surtees and a long pilgrims drop once more down the hill towards Hawthorns and Tandy's gonna have to pick his moment here because I think if he can get through he stands a reasonable chance of pulling away from Andrea Montermini but at the moment Montermini making himself almost impossible to overtake. So we've got the two Ferraris sandwiching the Porsche as Jimmy Bruni in the air Corsa car. It's already claimed two victories this year. Montermini just the one. And then three to Nick Tandy. So the three race winners we've had this year running first, second and third in the seventh race of the season through Sterlings. And that's a very neat exit from Jimmy Bruni. But again, Keith Tandy winding up for the move possibly towards Clearways. Montermini ever so slightly holding these up. He's just a couple of tenths slower per lap at the moment. And actually, Philip Pater in fourth place is pretty much matching the leading trio on lap times. They're all in the sort of high 137s, but then behind them from fifth place and back, Malicelli and co. in the one minute 40s, dropping back at around two to two and a half seconds per lap. As they come round now to start lap four, the gap is less than seven tenths of a second between Montermini and Tandy. They climb back up into Druids for the fourth time. Bruni dropping back ever so slightly. You can just make out Pater there in the background. And don't forget, this is a mandatory pit stop race. They'll all have a driver change. The pit window opens 28 minutes into the race, so we will see the race turn its head mid midway through. And Philip Petra is definitely making ground here in fourth position. He really is closing on Jimmy Green. Then we've got a long gap back to Malicelli in fifth. Up into sixth positions come Archie Hamilton. That's brilliant stuff from Archie. So he now leads the GTS class from Michele Ruggolo. Then we've got the two Corvettes, and they are still battling amongst themselves. I think we can certainly expect to see those cars both going a little bit quicker in the second half of the race when Nicky Pastorelli and Raffaele Giamria respectively take over at the wheel of those. So they accelerate out of Surtees and again along this fast back stretch. Are we going to see the move here from Giederic Shitoff on Michele Rugolo? Rugolo certainly thinks it's possible because he's covering the middle of the road. He leaves now a cause wet to the inside into Hawthorns anyway through there. No, there isn't. So they continue to run as they were in seventh, eighth and ninth position. It now brings Miguel Ramos who is uh, one of the drivers who would certainly describe himself as a gentleman driver, but he's a borderline pro-gentleman <laughs> driver and has got a great deal of experience. This is just Ramos' second appearance in the Corvette this year because he and Jim Rear previously campaigned a Ferrari 458, but they felt that car wasn't quite matching their ambitions, so they switched to the Corvette for the Spa round, and it's gone very well. And Ramos has now got the run on shit off as he got Fox Day in at Sterling's behind Ruggolo around the outside of Clearways. That's going to be a very bold move if he completes. He can't quite do it. He now jinks the inside as they accelerate along the Raven straight. Up at the front of the field, Montermini has suddenly broken Tandy's charge. He's suddenly pulled out to over two seconds ahead of the Porsche. Tandy was quicker as they went through the first sector, but Montermini really pulled it away as they went through the, uh, the back. And oh, and it's getting very close there in the battle uh, at Paddock Hill Bend. It really is. So, dear Derek Shitoff almost giving Michele Rugolo some assistance through Paddock and Rugolo decides enough's enough he leaves the door wide open at Druids allows the first of the Corvettes th through Miguel Ramos also trying to squeeze past him he's got the run now down the hill in Scram Hill Bend so Ramos gains the place as well he moves up into eighth position Rugolo of course continues to be second in the GTS class which is really probably his focus certainly for this stage of the race he doesn't want to get too entangled with the Super GT cars he takes a very tight line actually through Surtees, that will cost them a little bit of momentum, possibly along the back stretch. Whereas the more conventional wet line taken by Miguel Ramos by the wet line, we mean the line on the outside of the corner where all the marbles from the previous races have been laid down the track. And these drivers just never get a bit more purchase on that grid, a little bit more grip. And that's why you see the drivers maybe 
taking a slightly different approach to some of these corners than you normally would. Sitoff and uh, Ramos already beginning to pull away from Ruglo. Of course, their next target will be the leading GTS car of Archie Hamilton, which is in sixth place overall. Yeah, Archie Hamilton, who went very, very well here at Brands Hatch. I remember him performing Renault BARC at the start of his career. So he is going to be a driver to watch as we get another battle shaping up very nicely here. It's Alexander Tamkanitsa, who has got Stefano Bizzari closing in onto his tail. And they've also got Ram on the rack in that battle. So we've got the front couple of placings beginning to spread themselves out. Otherwise, it is very, very keenly contested throughout the rest of the pack. And they're still just spinning up those wheels as they exit Clark Curve and come on the Brabham straight in towards Paddock Hill Bend. Are we going to see the challenge here? That's a brilliant move from Bitsari up the inside of Alexander Talkanitsa. Talkanitsa, though, disputes it around the outside through Paddock and Ram on the rack is on the prowl here. He's looking to poach, poach that place as well from Talkanitsa. They climb up the hill towards Druids. Talkanitsa at the inside line. Does he get the car stopped and turned in on time? He does. No way through there then for the Porsche of Narak. That was a really nice move from Bitsari into Paddock. And somewhere along in this battle, Narak has slipped back down to 12th place in the Porsche, so it's really not going particularly well from the uh, championship leader here. Oh, we've got a spin, and it's Miguel Ramos who's gone wide at Graham Hill Bend. He rotates onto the track. He was just at the back of the shot, so Ramos, all of his efforts undone, and he recovers in front of our country box window as we've now got the battle here for fifth position. Matteo Malicelli has been caught here by Archie Hamilton. So super performance from Hamilton, and then we go back to this Narak battle. As you were saying, Keith, it's been a strange start to the race for Ram on the rack, but we've seen this all year, that he's taken a very steady start to the race and really raced for where that car is at the end of 70 minutes, not where it is at the end of 10 minutes, which is where we are now. Absolutely, you can't fault that it's been working for him so far. I mean, they've finished every single race in the top five. They haven't happened to have won one yet, but they're leading on the points. Yeah, and uh, in many respects, actually, it's not how many races you win, it's how many points you get, obviously, that wins you championships. There we see the tail end of... Miguel Ramos proving that the Chevrolet Corvette in Super GT specification is not designed for grip on grass. So he spins down the order. Yes, only caught the tail end of that spin there. Clearly Ramos had uh, lost control of that car some way before we picked it up, probably quite on the way into uh, Graham Hill Bend. Uh, meanwhile, back up at the front of the track, Andrea Montermini continues to pull away from Nick Tandy. The gap now up to 3.3 seconds with Jamaria Bruni falling 2.2 behind the Porsche driver. So here is probably the closest battle in the top five. Then it's Matteo Malicelli in the uh, Bua Racing Aston Martin, he's got Archie Hamilton in the Auto Orlando Sport Porsche, home in him, and Archie Hamilton, for the first time this year, really able to use home knowledge. He's raced here a lot at Brands Hatch, both in the Porsche Carrera Cup in the UK, and also for the Renault BARC, as we were alluding to earlier. Andrea Montermini leading the race, and as you were saying, Keith, he's pulling now some way clear of Nick Tandy, 3.3 seconds, the gap between the pair of them, and I, get, I just wonder whether that is a little bit of tyre preservation now coming in from the Porsche, because although it's got the superior traction, it generally gets through the tyres a little bit more quickly than the Ferraris, and they could just be taking the view that as the rain has stopped falling here, and the track may just begin to dry out, that they need those tyres to last them the full race duration, and so they are settling in to a steady pace, rather than disputing the matter with Montermini. Yes, although it's not rained for a little bit, you can still see on quite a lot of the track, particularly out in the countryside portion, there's still a lot of spray coming up from the, cut from the uh, cars. We're not yet seeing people go offline to cool those tyres and, and preserve them, um, but we still expect that, of course, they will at some point uh, have to come in to make that switch over because there's still almost a full hour left in this race. At the moment, though, we haven't got any signs of a dry line emerging as Tandy uses all of the green paint on the edge of the circuit. They were freshly painting that last night, so it's going to be very, very slippery for Nick Tandy. Nice and smooth though behind the wheel as he powers out of Druids down towards Graham Hill Bend. And Nick Tandy, who remember him in the Formula Ford Festival here years ago in absolutely teeming conditions. He was the master of the field on that day. So as, as if it gets wetter here, then I think we can expect to see Tandy moving back in towards the tail of Montermini. Yeah, the uh, battle between Malicelli and Hamilton just off uh, camera is starting to heat up. Malicelli in the number 12 car, Hamilton in the number 54 car. Um, I think those two are now about two-thirds of a second apart from each other as they cross the start-finish line. We may uh, we hold with the shot, pan back and see what's going on there. That's the number four car of Jamaria Bruni in third place behind him, Philip Pater. And that gap is coming down considerably, isn't it, because Philip Petter is much close to Bruni, who again takes a liberal dose of curb, runs very wide at Westfield, and this is Petter's opportunity. He draws alongside and goes through at Dean Goldell. Will he hold it through Sheen? Again, brilliant drive from Philip Petter, vastly experienced in these cars, and that was the tiniest error from Jimmy Bruni. We'd seen that lap coming down 
that gap coming down lap on lap and Philip Petter took his opportunity through he went and so Philip Petter then up into third position Jimmy Bruni shuffled down to fourth now what has Jimmy Bruni got left in his pocket here to fight back and see if he can overhaul the car of Philip Petter they streak through we've still got an awful long way to go in this race and again the car's scrabbling for grip along the Brabham straight well, Bruni in the dry conditions, Keith, has been pretty much undefeatable at the wheel of that AF course Ferrari. These, this wet weather, a slightly different proposition because now Petter's gone through, he's actually pulling away. He certainly is, yeah, and he's looking uh, perhaps capable of getting on terms with perhaps Nick Tandy, but Montermini, you have to say, is still consistently quicker than Tandy at the moment. Tandy is, in fact, demolishing Montermini in the first sector, but Montermini is taking it all and back in the middle part of the lap with the, uh, with the long, fast, straight section. We have a replay here. This is the pass. Uh, on Bruni by Pater for third place and really that just fell into Pater's hands perfectly he'd been catching and catching Bruni and just as he arrived on the mirror of him as you say Bruni made that tiny little mistake and it was just enough for Pater to get alongside and capitalize yeah it's a very quick section of the circuit as well to go through there at Dingle they don't often see overtake he moves but Philip Petter took advantage so there's Montermini here is Nick Tandy and that gap has it come down just a little bit I think it has on that last lap you know and it looks to have come down even less on this lap, yes, it has it by about two tenths of a second. So Nick Tandy now beginning to reel Andrea Montermini back in. We are still some way away from the pit stops where Montermini hands over to Juan Manuel Lopez. Nick Tandy to Marco Holzer, which often plays into the hands of Tandy and Holzer. And then Philip Petter in third, who is putting Dale up between himself and Jimmy Bruni in fourth position. Bruni, again, he's out over the curbs, and that's really not going to be helping for the traction of that Ferrari because those curves are very very slippery the circuit staff were out until late last night painting them so they were nice and bright and that means though with the rain coming down today is they're even more slippery than they would normally be as the race leader plunges through Paddock Hill Bend and Montermini unlike Bruni giving the curves a very wide berth so Montermini then leading through Druids just uh, twitching around but at the moment this this is why Andrea Montermini at one time what was being talked about as Ferrari as Ferrari's next Formula One superstar. He tested Ferrari in the early 1990s. His Formula One career never quite kicked off. But now, if you want a GT car driven quickly, Andrea Montermini's your man to go to. No, he really has carved out an excellent career. Uh, and obviously, here in GT racing, in the Open GT Championship, he was uh, the champion in 2008, runner up last year, runner up also in 2007 and uh, 14 wins to his name already. And even in these early stages of the race, it appears to be eyeing his 15th. And he was so relaxed before the race as well. He was. Uh, downloading podcasts through his iPod about half an hour before the race got underway so he really uh, does enjoy his racing and is uh, very very relaxed and personable off track as is Nick Tandy who spent last weekend rather than watch the British Grand Prix he was at King's Lynn for the World Banger Racing Championships because that is where Nick Tandy's career started out in mini stocks racing before moving up through Formula Ford and into GT racing back to the battle then for fourth fifth and I make that sixth well, it's fifth, sixth, and seventh, isn't it? Rather, Malicelli, Hamilton, and then the Chevrolet Corvette of Thierry Derek Shitov. And still, we've got this group of cars, and Dallas Stella's now got past Ram on the rack. So, Narak is, he remains in 12th position because of the demise of Miguel Ramos, but he's actually at the back of this queue of cars, and he's finding a way to work through it. He is, and you know, if he's playing the waiting game, he really is, because he's now the best part of 37 seconds behind the leader, but we have a big change of the conditions here at Brands Hatch. It is absolutely tipping down once again. The, as you can see, it now streaming off the track, huge plumes of stray coming out the back of the cars, and you can see the enormous light plumes around the cars, uh, headlamps as they come out of these corners. The conditions now getting much, much worse, and the lap times dropping off hugely. Big, big challenge now for the drivers because they've run for quite a way and they've done already 17 minutes running on these wet weather tyres. They'll be quite worn. The grooves won't be as shallow. They won't be able to clear the water as well. And now they've suddenly got to contend with a downpour. Yeah, very tricky conditions. These are not unlike the conditions we had for race six of the year, which was the second race at Spa, which was held in similarly atrocious weather. And there's Juan Manuel Lopez, who doesn't look overly enthused about the, the prospect of taking over at the wheel of that car in about 25 minutes' time. And can't really blame him because it, it is very difficult, particularly for these drivers, as the grit levels are now going to be changing lap on lap. Out under the trees, though, it, it will take one or two laps before the rain really starts to come down, which is why you can still see that groove from the wheel tracks. Nick Tandy, now, will this be his opportunity to close on Andrea Montermini, or will it go the other way? Because the gap, in fact, went out on the last lap by almost one and a half seconds, and Tandy leaps over the curbs at Sheen in towards Sterling's. This will then punch him back. Towards clearways, Keith, where the track is really at its wettest. 
yeah, you can see it, it's really starting to come down very heavily now. And if anything, Tandy is going to have to worry more about Pitta. We have a replay here. This is the Talkanitsa Ferrari and uh, the number 44 of Dalla Stella. Uh, Talkanitsa defending position on the inside at Graham Hill Bend. Dalla Stella goes around the outside, makes the position stick. And there's Raymond Narak in the background on 12th place. Did he also make it past the Talkanitsa Ferrari? Now, here's an earlier replay from up at Druids. And Talkanitsa turned in uh, quite sharply there on Dalla Stella. Yeah, so the Kessel Racing and AT Racing Ferraris going door handle to door handle. We'll find out how that resolved itself shortly as Philip Petter in third position. Now, what can he do about closing in on Nick Tandy here as he kicks up a bow wave out of Druids on towards Graham Hill Bend? Through the left hander, he comes. Philip Petter, another driver who you'd always turn to to uh, pilot a Ferrari very quickly. He's been paired with uh, Michael Brosnitsky for the past few seasons. And they were 15th in last year's International GT Open Championship. They've already had a couple of podiums this year. They were second in the opening race of the year. And of course, now they're also second in the second race at the Nürburgring as well. And Philip Petter now driving that car to be well placed to claim another podium today because he really is heading off into the distance away from Jimmy Brinney. The headlights ablaze, peering through the murk. And the water now being picked up by these big Super GT cars is quite considerable. And it's a good point you were making, Keith, about these wet weather tyres, because the wet weather tyres have got reasonably sharp grooves cut into them when they're brand new, and that is what gives them the ultimate grip. And given they run the first probably 10, 12 inches of this race on a slightly drying track, those grooves will have rounded off. So although they've got wet tyres, although they've got tread, they're probably not quite as grippy as they would have been if they'd been running in these conditions at the start of the race. Absolutely, and we can see the consequence of that is the top three runners are all pretty much status quo. They're all running in the low 37s. Bruni's falling back at a second a lap. Uh, we've then got Malicelli in fifth place. This is another further a second per lap slower. And uh, yes, and sorry, I think our timing screen is uh, showing something incorrect here. It's throwing me off my pace slightly. Um, yeah, it looks uh, we may have a transponder issue there for Andrea Montermini. We will, in fact, no, we don't. Montermini has not come through. So Andrea Montermini has gone missing somewhere out in the murk. We will find out what that is, or has he had a bit of a rotation? Yes, there he is. He's in fourth position. So Montermini has had a moment that we didn't see on camera. He's now slipped down into fourth. So it must have been a spin then for Andrea Montermini, although he's going quite slowly. We see that from our contra box. So the new race leader, Nick Tandy, has got Philip Petter chasing him down, accelerating out onto the Grand Prix loop once more. <coughs> and then we've got up into third place then, Jimmy Bruni. And what is the gap between Nick Tandy and Philip Petter? It's 2.6 seconds. It looks like it's a little bit less than that. It's pretty much the length of that short shoot between Hawthorne and Westfield between the race leading Porsche and then the chasing in second position Ferrari of Philip Petter climbing through Dingle Dell on towards Sheen. And now there's pools of standing water beginning to form on the track. Yes, you can see there. The line that the drivers have been taking through is, is less wet, but on the rest of the circuit, it is just that, that sheen which shows you how solid the water is there. And we're getting a replay now from Druids, and it's a spin for the Talcan. It's a Ferrari into the side of Michele Rugolo. Rugolo. And that promoted Ram on the rack. So the rack gains two places. Rugolo is beached in the gravel trap, so Rugolo is going no further in this one, unfortunately. And Alexander Talkanitsa may well have sustained a little bit of damage as well. And that's always the risk of going for a move. And Michele Rugolo probably got every right to feel somewhat unimpressed with that because he was completely innocent. Nick Tandy turning through the scene of the incident now at Druids. And that was just one of those moments, though, that you get in these wet conditions. Drivers being caught out by, by the lack of grip. And uh, unfortunately, Michele Rugolo in the wrong place at the wrong time. Up at the front, the gap continues to close between Tandy and Pater. It's just a little bit over two seconds now but Montemini having gathered his Ferrari uh, 458 back up again is once again the fastest driver on the track he's closing on Gian Maria Bruni for third place who's 4.8 seconds ahead did a 36.6 the last time by taking the best part of eight tenths of a second out of the other Ferrari of Bruni so the two uh, ex Formula One drivers about to converge on the track in a few laps time I would imagine in a battle for third place yeah and we're gonna have this battle for the lead though coming together aren't we because last lap 
it was four tenths that Philip Petter took out of Nick Tandy's advantage. So Tandy is pushing as hard as he dares. He knows that probably his co-driver, Marco Holzer, is going to be a little bit quicker for Michael Brosnitsky. But the other fact we haven't really discussed today is that the way that the cars are equalised in the International GT Open is the addition of time to pit stops for the cars that were the top three in each class in the preceding race. So the car that wins its class gets 15 seconds added to its pit stop time. The car that was second, 10 seconds. The car that was third, five. And that means that Manti Racing Porsche has got 15 seconds more to spend in the pits than the number 11 Kessel Racing Ferrari of Michael Brosnitsky and Philip Petter, which finished in sixth position and therefore incurs no additional pit stop time at all. So that is something we'll have to watch for. It means that Nick Tandy really needs to try and build up as much as a buffer over Philip Petter as he possibly can. But at the moment, it's Petter who brings the gap down. It's now under two seconds, just 1.7 seconds between the pair of them. And Philip Petter, Keith, five and a half tenths past the Nick Tandy on that last lap, which on a, a one minute 40 second lap is a, a massive amount of time to gain. Yeah, we still have these two battles for first and third coming together. And here's another replay of the uh, shenanigans up at Druids a few laps earlier that really fell into the uh, lap of Raymond Narak uh, beautifully. The Porsche driver now up to 10th place. Uh, but still a long way behind the leaders. In fact, the leaders passed us over 40 seconds ago, and we're still waiting to see Narak uh, begin his 14th lap. So I peer forward from our commentary position. The Porsche passes by me as I do, and he's 47.6 seconds behind. He is, and Philip Petter, though, is considerably less than that behind Nick Tandy as they accelerate out of Hawthorns on towards Westfield, and the gap seems to come down even more, but the rain is now making visibility very, very difficult for these drivers out on the Grand Prix loop because the, the water really hangs in the air between the trees, and so almost into a smoke screen comes Philip Petter over the crest at Sheen, and this is where we've got the water just beginning to form that sheen on the surface. Then they turn through Sterling's. It's a quick left-hander, even in the wet, because the camber really works in favour for the drivers. And then down a very steep drop into clearways, and Nick Tandy is going to come through then and complete his 15th lap of the race. We've got 45 minutes left on the clock. And what is the gap between them going to be? So over the line comes Nick Tandy, and then Philip Petter follows through... Or does he? Yes, 1.7 seconds. So actually, Nick Tandy has pretty much matched Philip Petter's time on that lap. There's Marco Holzer waiting in the Manti Racing pit, ready to take over from Nick Tandy. Eyes firmly fixed on the monitor. And at the moment, it's probably maximum anxiety for these drivers in the garages, particularly when they're waiting to take over from the race lead, because Holzer knows there's a real burden on his shoulders to try and bring that car home to a win. Yep, and as we look still at the leader, Nick Tandy, with second place, Philip Pater behind him. Behind them, we still have Jan Maria Bruni and former leader, Andrea Montermini. Montermini continuing to make his recovery after losing the lead with what we believe was uh, a spin a few laps ago. He's now 3.2 seconds behind Jan Maria. The pair both in Ferrari uh, 458 GTs. The gap continuing to close between the two. Malicelli some way behind in fifth, in fifth place. Archie Hamilton, who's still driving an excellent race in the uh, GTS car, has dropped a little bit back off the back of Malicelli, but still, Diedrich Sch Sidhoff, who was catching him, has pretty much stopped, and the gap between the two is more or less stationary. Yeah, and closing on to their tail as well as Stefano Bizzari. We haven't seen Bizzari, but he in the 56 car is making ground hand over fist at the moment. So the GTS classification, it is Hamilton from Bizzari and Dallas Stella. That's the top three as things stand, but really this race, I think we are yet to see the more that looks likely to give us the podium because we are not yet at the driver interchange opening and the pit window opening for that mid-race period. We've still got 44 minutes to go and the conditions are ever-changing because after the deluge we had a few moments ago, the rain has now temporarily abated. It's still drizzly in the air, but we've certainly got the rain coming down like we did. And is that going to give the pet of the opportunity to start closing back in on Nick Tandy? He was fractionally faster last lap, just 76 thousandths of a second, which I don't think is going to give Nick Tandy too much cause for concern, other than that it just means that the Ferrari get fractionally larger in his mirrors. Tandy, that's a great shot, isn't it? Into the cockpit at Graham Hill Ben. You can see Tandy still so smooth behind the wheel as we look a little bit further back. And I think this is a replay from last lap. It was Bitsari who I mentioned, and Bitsari's challenge temporarily abated a slight spin into Surtees. It's easily done there because you, you just have a very wide turn in and you can put a wheel on the white line or on the grass. Tipped and spin, that's exactly what happened for Bitsari. But as we were saying, Keith, Nick Tandy looking very smooth at the wheel of that Porsche. 
He is the bright yellow and green Porsche. Could he do? Look at that terrible Merc. You can see how bright the lights are, but he's probably got the best visibility of anybody on the track. 1.7 seconds behind him, Philip Pater having to deal with the huge amount of spray coming off that Porsche. And you can see uh, as his Ferrari emerges from that massive cloud, the uh, yellow sticking tape around the side from where it clouded the pit wall in qualifying earlier today in the hands of his uh, teammates. Um, but still holding up in second place, uh, looking quite uh, comfortable over Bruni, who's still a long way back in third. We're now looking at uh, the Aston Martin, just passing out of view. Yeah, Matteo Malicelli then in fifth position. And Malicelli, he's got Hamilton there or thereabouts. This has been a really fine drive from Archie Hamilton because he was just a little bit lost at Spa and Nürburgring. But he's got Ewan Hanke here this weekend doing some driver coaching with him. And it has really worked for him. He's just got his head in the right place. He, he felt that he needed to relax a little bit more and actually just start enjoying the driving, letting it flow. And he's been doing that this weekend on a circuit he's familiar with. And it really is resulting in his finest performance of the season thus far because in these conditions to be driving at that sort of pace is a very good job indeed. There is Andrea Montermini in fourth position as he continues to try and close in on Jimmy Bruni. He's reasonably succeeding that as the driver changes have now started. So the pit window is open. We are 40% of the way into the race and the pit window open between 40% and 60% of race distance. That means from minutes 28 to 42 within the race. And so when are we going to start seeing some of these driver changes starting? You would expect that where the teams have got the more experienced drivers, they're going to keep them out as deep into this race as possible. But we, and then conversely, when you've got the more experienced driver to get behind the wheel, as it is in the case of Daniel Zampieri, he takes over now from Michael Dallastella. And I think here we can expect to see fireworks from the former Italian Formula 3 champion. Also in as well, Ram on the rack to change to Patrick Pile. And that, Keith, is a driver change we, we'd have seen coming quite early in the rack. Just hasn't seemed comfortable during his stint. No, he slipped back. I mean, they started from eighth place. He, he had moved up to 10th, but that uh, that position rather fell into his lap somewhat. Uh, and we'll see what Pile can do now and whether he'll be able to drag that car back up into the top five as we look now at Nick Tandy picking his way through uh, some of the traffic in these uh, terrible a little bit offline as he comes out of clearways and Clark Curve to begin another lap. And now it will be up to Philip Pater to deal with the uh, lapped Ferrari in between the pair of them. Yeah, that's Stephen Earle, who at one time was the six years in a row Ferrari USA champion. And Steve absolutely loves his motor racing. He's an orthopedic surgeon by trade, but he and based in Mississippi, but he, he really does enjoy his racing. He's very experienced at the wheel of a Ferrari, but he's not making it too easy here for his Kessel Racing teammate, Philip Petter, to find a way past him. As we now get the change from Andrea Montermini out of the car, Juan Manuel Lopez takes over from Montermini. So they choose to make their pit stop fairly early. We've also seen off camera the pit change between the Taufnitzer six times and Taufnitzer Junior who is now at the wheel of the number five car. All seems to be perfectly in order there for the Velour Bacors team as Nick Tandy continues to charge on. Well, certainly any of the cars they're encountering to lap them have got no excuse for not seeing that Manti racing port, have they? Because <laughs> it's very, very bright. And Tandy, as a result of Philip Petter being a little bit held up, has actually pulled away. So the graphic you're seeing on the screen there of Petter reeling in Tandy has now all rather been undone by Philip Petter's delay behind Stephen Earl. Petter is past Earl now, but you can see that gap has gone out a little bit over the course of this lap. So are we going to see the change this time around from Nick Tandy to hand over to Marco Holes? We're about to find out as they come out of Sterling's and into Clearways. Tandy, though, looks to be carrying a fair amount of pace through Clearways. He does, and so Tandy is going to go on to another lap. Suspect that Philip Petter will do much the same thing. Yes, so Philip Petter through in second position. How much time did Petter lose behind Stephen Earl? As through he comes. Yeah, he lost half a second on that last lap to Nick Tandy. And unfortunately for Philip Petter, Keith, he's only got a couple of laps now to try and close that gap down for. He has to pit in to hand over to Michael Brosnitsky. Yes, and obviously we'll see what happens now to Bro Brosnitsky as we now look at uh, the tyre change. It's uh, sorry, the driver change rather. It's uh, Freddie Kramer coming in to hand over to uh, his teammate. Yeah, so it's Stephen Earl and Freddie Kramer, in fact, getting oh, behind the wheel. So uh, Freddie Kramer, another of the gentleman drivers who really does enjoy his racing. You'll, you'll see him in the paddock from dusk till dawn on race weekends, uh, and just thoroughly relishes the atmosphere in the international GT Open paddock. So they are pretty much having an even division of driving responsibilities. Philip Petter, has he lost ground again on this lap to Nick Tandy? That gap, Keith, may have gone out slightly. It does seem to be that, that Tandy's maybe just edging a tenth here or there, though. Fairly static. 
what we can say for certain is that Bruni isn't catching the pair of them. He's still over uh, 10 seconds behind in the other Ferrari and not quite showing the pace in these wet conditions. As you said before, he's been very, very quick in the dry, but in, this, uh, in these wet conditions, he's been dropping back quite steadily from this uh, lead pair. Well, this is going to give us an absolutely enthralling second half to the race because Marco Holzer is of a comparable pace to Nick Tandy. He's never raced here, and they've got an extra 15 seconds on their pit stop. Michael Brosnitsky, not quite as quick as Philip Petterbuck, has improved enormously this season. And Federico Leo, likewise, who takes over from Jimmy Bruni, is not, not as quick as Jimmy, but he's probably a little bit quicker than Michael Brosnitsky. So we really could see these three cars coming together in the uh, second half of the race. It will give us some fantastic entertainment here at Brands Hatch as we see Andrea Cecalero taking over from Massimo Mantovani. So Mantovani out, Cecalero about to come in they all have bespoke seats these drivers which get inserted in, in case the drivers are of a slightly different height and girth and so that's why you'll sometimes see the bits of firm foam being inserted into the cars in the pit stop which is what we saw there for Andrea Cecalero she also about to go into the Kessel Racing Ferrari Corvette and then that one will be back into the actions with just about a half race distance and flashing his lights through the spray is Nick Tandy because now he's getting into the traffic Keith this is when he's going to absolutely have to have his wits about him yes we've seen uh, Tandy and Peter coming through a couple of cars already on this lap and, and taking quite big chances as they went around Druids and uh, Graham Hill Ben not wanting to lose any time Tandy goes past there now we have uh, Alvaro Barber taking over from Matteo Malicelli in the Aston uh, and you can see the driver's engine going on here in the background filling the Aston Martin Vantage with fuel yeah, so Alvaro Barber, a, a driver of a comparable pace to Matteo Malicelli. So I think we can expect to see that car as well, really driving itself back into contention as this race progresses. 36 minutes, though, remain. And are we going to see either of the race leaders pitting in this time around? It certainly doesn't look like it by the poise of the cars and the angles of attack through clearway. So they are going to go through and into another lap. We're about to complete the 21st lap of the race. Now has Philip Petter closed in on Nick Tandy this time around over the line? they come now and yes down to 1.3 seconds so philip petter is chipping away 10th on 10th uh, nick tandy's advantage here they're about to come up onto the tail of juan manuel lopez who of course has had his pit stop so that is going to be an interesting conundrum for them as jimmy bruni we watch through paddock hill bend is some 13 seconds back from the leaders he's napping at a not dissimilar pace to the leaders but he's not closing in on them but again I think Federico Leo when he takes over from Jimmy Bruni here Keith could be in a very nice position to claim victory he certainly could we've had uh, a couple more pit stops and so Deirdre Sithoff has appeared in fourth place we've had uh, Marco Mapelli taking over from Archie Hamilton who was running uh, in fifth place earlier on so there is Jimmy Bruni accelerating out onto the Grand Prix loop and Bruni, a reasonably lonely third position at this moment in the race. Federico Lea, his co-driver, has recently made the move into GT racing from single season World Series by Renault as Bruni comes up onto the tail of Freddie Kramer. He's able to clear Kramer with no problems. And then Leo, last year's FAA GT3 champion as well. So he, he's got the pedigree in GT cars, Federico Lea, and he's learning so much from Jimmy Bruni. Bruni, in his spare time, runs a professional cycle racing team to keep fit occasionally actually goes out and competes in the races with them he was uh, out in new york a little bit earlier in the year now this is a car we can expect to fly in the second part of the race rafael gia maria taking over from miguel ramos gia maria who was fourth in last year's international gt open third the year before and very quick gt driver very quick single seater driver gia maria before moving into gts as well the most unlikely looking racing driver too to look at him you'd think he was a phd student or a college professor, very scholarly looking Rafael Gia Maria, but then when he gets in the car, the red mist comes down, and he really can turn in a very rapid stint as Nick Tandy is closing in here on the tail of Juan Manuel Lopez, and this, for Tandy, Keith, very difficult because he's coming up to a car which is of a broadly comparable pace. Yes, this is going to be a, a tricky uh, bit of lap and see. This is obviously the car that was leading the race until fairly recently, although it has already made its uh, mandatory driver change. That still lies ahead of Nick Tandy, first place, and Philip Pater, second place, as we pass the halfway point in this 70-minute race. So down into fourth horns, and Philip Petter is closing ever more steadily onto the tail of Nick Tandy. It's just 1.1 seconds between the pair of them. It looks to be a little bit less than that now as Nick Tandy is caught up behind Juan Manuel Lopez and Tandy will be anxious to get through here. 
Lopez, though, running his own race. So through Sheen, and they're almost bumper to bumper. And Tandy, is he going to risk it into Sterling's? He dives to the inside. I'm not sure that Lopez saw him. He covers the apex. And Tandy has to pick his moment very carefully here. And still Lopez weaving across the track in front of Nick Tandy. And I, I would imagine that Lopez thinks he's racing Tandy for position here. And Tandy, though, able to finally force his way through at clearways and then immediately ducks into the pit lane. So Nick Tandy into the pits to hand over to Marco Holzer. Philip Petter, though, continues on his way. So it's now Philip Petter who takes over the lead of the race and also assumes the responsibility of trying to put a lap on Juan Manuel Lopez, which Nick Tandy did for about five metres. So here comes Tandy. Marco Holzer runs out, takes over from Tandy. And, of course, they have got this additional pit handicap. So that is going to keep them in the pits for 15 seconds longer than the cars they're racing against as Tandy straps Holzer in. Marco Holzer, a Porsche Works driver. He's come up through the uh, Porsche development driver scheme. He was the winner of last year's Nervo in 24 hours as well. He was also, the start of his career, the former BMW World Finals champion back in 2005. And that then gave him the opportunity to test the BMW Formula 1 car, which was the prize for winning the Formula BMW World Finals. And that's Marco Holzer who will take over the number 8 Manti Racing Porsche, and it will predominantly be doing battle with this car, the number 11, Kessel Racing Ferrari 458 of Philip Petter. Now that Petter has got some clear track key, let's see if he stays out a little bit longer and tries to uh, take advantage of being in clear air to put in some quick laps. Yep, of course, drivers can only run up to 60% race distance before they have to hand over to the driver. So Petter doesn't have an awful lot more laps before he has to come in to hand over to his uh, teammate. Uh, Tandy, however, he had, I mean, he has this extra 15 seconds stop. And, and as I talk to you, I can see the car now in the hands of Marco Holzer leaving the pit lane. They did have to stay 15 seconds longer in the pits, but they had a, an advantage of almost that over everybody else in the field, bar Philip Pater. They were 13.4 seconds ahead of Bruni when they came into the pits. So at the very worst, they should shake out from these pit stops in third place, perhaps even better. Well, Marco Holzer now a little bit of a voyage into the unknown as we see another of the pit stops well underway. That's Alan Kalari taking over from Iraj Alexander, the all-Swiss driver pairing. As here comes Jimmy Bruni, so Jimmy Bruni making his pit stop, and that is for Federico Leo to take over from some of the former Minardi Formula 1 driver. Comes into his pit box as Nicky Pastorelli exits the pits in the Corvette. Driver door open almost before the car stops. Federico Leo clams in these drivers as they come down the pit lane, be loosening their seat belts to make sure that they can spring out of the car as quickly as possible, because what they want to do really is get that pit stop completed actually long in advance of when the car can actually be, be released back into the race. So it's Petter who continues in the lead, but he's only going to be able to stay out there for another couple of minutes. So I would imagine that he may do one more lap after this one and then will make his pit stop because with the exception of the uh, Pizzari and Rizzoli car, everybody else has been into the pits for their pit stop. So Philip Petter leaving it very late. And he runs wide at Sheen. He was out over the grass there, Philip Petter. So he really is pushing, which is what we thought he'd do. So now, will he come into the pits on this occasion? Out of Sterling's, down the hill towards Clearways. Federico Leo leaves the pit lane. And are we seeing into the pit lane, Philip Petter? Yes, we are. He breaks very late. Dives in, and that is to hand over to Michael Brozanitsky. So we'll find out in the next few moments what the order looks like except to say from our contrary box we can see that Federico Leo has left the pits about four seconds ahead of Marco Holzer so it's Leo Keith who now takes over the effective race lead pending when Brosnitsky feeds out yeah there wasn't very much in it only uh, only a second or two I would say at most between uh, like, although as I see looking out the window I can see Holzer running wide at Graham Hill Bend he keeps it on the track however <laughs> meanwhile Petter handing over to Brosnitsky in the pits and we have here a replay this is the Corvette of Nicky Pastorelli going pastoral as he takes the opportunity to explore the grass at Surtees. He should rejoin. He does. So there is Marco Holzer. And if we then move to the next shot, we'll still see Holzer. But as that shot widens, we should see the car of Federico Leo up the road ahead of him somewhere in that ball spray. There is Leo and there is Holzer. So Marco Holzer work to do to chase down Federico Leo. We are going to be in for an absolutely enthralling conclusion to this race as rumbling along the pit lane now comes Michael Brosnitsky. So Brosnitsky is about to be released into the action and he should have taken over in the lead of the race here. He will and that means 
Patrick Pile is almost the best part of the lap down in the Mack Porsche, and he's up behind Alexander Talkinitsa Jr. And Talkinitsa Jr. makes it very difficult for him at Graham Hill Bend, and though runs a little bit wide, but Talkinitsa Jr., who has really relished the the upgrades to the Ferrari 4 of 8 this year, particularly the switch to paddle shift gearboxes, it's just clipped for Alexander Talkinitsa Jr., and he's now doing a good job keeping the very experienced Patrick Pile behind him. You do get a sense there might be something inevitable about this, however, Pile piling on the pressure as they come down Paddock Hill and head towards Hawthorns. Is he going to have a look into this super fast right hander? He certainly is. Is Talkinitsa going to give him space? He certainly isn't, and he continues to keep the Pile Porsche behind him as they come out now into the second right hander. Pile has got the overlap, and the championship leader takes the place of Alexander Talkinitsa Jr. That's experience for you, isn't it, Patrick Pile? very smoothly through on Alexander Talkinitsa Jr., but he is still, unfortunately, only up into ninth position as a result of that. And now, with 27 minutes left in the race, we're about to see what sort of chase we've got on as we wait for Michael Brosnitsky to come through and complete his first lap out of the pits. And then that will give us an indication of uh, just what sort of task lies ahead of Federico Leo and Marco holds it. So there is Leo turning through Westfield. Now, by my reckoning, I think the Brosnitsky is probably about 20 seconds or thereabouts up the road, which is going to mean almost a second a minute. They're going to need to reel in on the Polish driver over the remainder of the race. So this could be Brosnitsky and Petter's first victory of the season. Let's see how it transpires. Waiting still for Brosnitsky to come through and complete his outlap from oh, the pits. Oh, we've got to move, sorry, there between... Uh, that's Juan uh, Lopez taking, was that Pile? It was, no it wasn't, it was Juan Juan Lopez and Marco Mapelli who have, have been busy going wheel to wheel. So Brosnitsky is through, he's 18 seconds then clear of Federico Leo in second position and just a second back, or 1.4 seconds back from Leo is Marco Holzer. Leo is trying, Keith. Leo having a huge moment as he came down uh, Paddock Hill Bend there as he sets off in pursuit of Michael Brosnitsky. But he's going to have to deal, I think, very soon with Marco Holzer, who's looking very racy uh, in that Manthe Racing Porsche and was taking a few tenths uh, out of Leo as they went around on the previous lap. We've got 25 minutes left on the clock. Is that going to be enough for them to take out Michael Brosnitsky's 18 second lead, or is this going to be the first win of the season for the Kemmel Racing Ferrari? Yeah, so. Michael Brosnitsky then leads the way. Philip Petter, we just caught a glimpse of him in the pits. He'll very shortly be on the radio in the Kessel Racing Garage talking to Michael as we see a replay of more wheel-to-wheel -wheel action. This is the Pile move on Taukonitsa, and that is astonishingly brave in these conditions from Patrick Pile, and that is why he is a Porsche Works driver. Michael Brosnitsky, 25 minutes to go. Will he be able to hold on he was 14th in last year's international gt open he was the gts champion in the gt open back in 2009 and another driver who's really adapted very very well to the introduction of the ferrari 458 so brosnitsky on to complete the 27th lap of the race with just under 25 minutes remaining across the line then goes michael brosnitsky and his lap time a one minute 36.8 from brosnitsky now let's see what federico leo can do in his pursuit. We watch Rosnitsky on screen. Now we see Federico Leo as he accelerates along the Raven straight. What time has Leo done across the line? He flashes now, and it's a 1 minute 37, a 1 minute 38, rather, a 1 minute 38.9. It was, in fact, a 1 minute 40.7 from Brosnitsky, and so he brings the gap down to 16.2 seconds. That was almost two seconds on that last lap, which means this could be on for Federico Leo and Marco Holzer. I think at that kind of pace, we're in for a, a very exciting final 10 or 15 minutes of, yeah, of, this, of this race as uh, Leo and Holzer reel in uh, Brosnitsky. But perhaps what could be decisive here is if Holzer and Leo end up in a battle between the pair of them and end up holding themselves up uh, so much so that the Kemmel Racing Ferrari can build up a bit of a gap. Uh, Juan Manuel Lopez, meanwhile, has continued in fourth place, having taken over from uh, Andrea Montermi with Mapelli in fourth. But, yep, still Brosnitsky out in front, leading by... Uh, 16 seconds, but that gap's going to come down a lot over the uh, remaining 23 minutes of this race. Well, I'd imagine Olaf Mantai, the manager of the Mantai Racing Porsche team, will be on the radio to Marco Holzer saying, don't do anything too silly here, because Olaf has run this team very, very successfully in GT racing, also in DTM racing. Olaf himself was a DTM competitor about 20 years ago. And so they will just be saying, hold station behind Federico Leo for now, reel in Michael Brosnitsky, then worry about the... Uh, the challenge to, to Leo to maybe snatch the race lead as we 
check on the GTS class leader. It's Marco Mapelli, and this is a very fine performance from Marco Mapelli. He's got the advantage over Andrea Rizzoli and then Daniel Zampieri, but Zampieri is probably going to be the man to watch as he tries to close in on Rizzoli and Mapelli, although it is a fairly big ask, I think, for Zampieri to do that. So Marco Mapelli and Archie Hamilton, well, they've been GTS class wins already this year, fought them out. They would very much like to achieve that once more. Meanwhile, the race leaders have come through. The lap, it lap was another one minute 40 from Michael Bosnitsky, a 40.2, as opposed to a 38.9 from Federico Lea. It brings the gap down to 14.9 seconds between the pair of them. This is uh, really going to come to the ball very nicely. You do not want to take your eyes off this race because this is just going to get closer and closer over the laps to come. And I think we could very shortly be talking about a very tense three-way battle for the lead here between Rosnitsky, Leo and Holzer. I think really it will start to feel real for Federico, Leo and Marco Holzer once they get underneath that 10-second barrier. That's where they need to get to to challenge Brosnitsky because at the moment, if Brosnitsky keeps circulating the low 1 minute 40s, so 1 minute 40.2, and Federico Leo's in the high one minute 38. That is maybe just good enough here for Brosnitsky. And now Marco Holzer is caught between Devlin and Deep Blue Sea because on one hand, does he hold station behind Leo? Let Leo do the chasing and they work together. On the other hand, he feels he's a little bit quicker maybe than the A of course Ferrari. He wants to try and force that move as quickly as possible to give himself the best part of 20 minutes to chase down Michael Brosnitsky. Well, we're gonna see very shortly at the end of this lap whether Leo has made any further inroads to Brosnitsky so Brosnitsky is through and is metronomically consistent at the moment Michael Brosnitsky as we've got a yellow flag at Graham Hill Bend that's off camera but we've got a spinner from one of the Ferraris in the GTS class across the line goes Federico Leo and a slower lap from Leo 1 minute 39.5 and Marco Holzer a 1 minute 38.8 so Holzer is going to have to force this on Leo fairly shortly because Brosnitsky on that last lap was only eight tenths of seconds slower than Federico Leo, and that is comfortably enough for Brosnitsky to hold on to victory. Holzer, though, won't be making a move into Graham Hill Bend. We've got the yellow flags out at Graham Hill Bend because he's got a car that's spun and is stranded off track and realizing that he's not finding too much grip on grass. So Leo taking a slightly odd line into Surtees as well, and this is almost the worst case scenario for Marco Holzer, which is actually defense coming on as it is Freddie Kramer who has had the spin over at Graham Hill Bend. He just snagged a wheel on the grass on the way in, rotates the car and he's not rejoined. So yeah, Federico Leo, he's, he's driving quite defensively here, Keith, and that means that Holzer is both having an enforced slow lap time, but also he's struggling to get past him. Yeah, Leo already now seems to be more minded about holding on to second instead of uh, taking first place, even with 20 minutes to go. And you can just see the little telltale signs as they're heading to the braking zones. He's slightly covering the inside. He's not hard defending he's just slightly starting to cover although i expect that's going to change very soon because tandy is right on his tail oh, sorry not tandy holzer holzer is right on his tail now and i think we can see holzer having a look at him one thing we can say is the conditions now are not dissimilar to what they were like at the very start of the race it's been a good 20 25 minutes without any further rain a lot of the surface water has been lifted the track's still very wet and those are the conditions in which we saw the Porsche going very, very well and in the hands of uh, Tandy attacking Montemini for the lead. And here comes Holzer now taking a big look at Leo as they come into Paddock Hill Bend, starting the 30th lap. Holzer maintaining a watching brief for now, though, behind Leo. And crucially on that last lap, they're also both a second faster than Michael Brosnitsky, so that gap came down as well. Holzer is he close enough to challenge Leo, which really could be. Federico Leo runs very wide at the hairpin. Holzer taking the much tighter line. The yellow flag's now retracted at Graham Hill Bend. So we're fully green around the course once more. Has climbing all over the curves on the way into Graham Hill Bend. Pause Federico Leo. He really is a little bit ragged now. And Marco Holzer, it feels like it's only a matter of time before the young German driver picks his way past Federico Leo. Leo again, not making friends with the apex at Surtees. Accelerating then out onto the Grand Prix loop. And Holzer, he's got a run here, possibly on Federico Leo. It depends just how committed Leo is through Hawthorns here because we saw Patrick Pile teeing up that move into Westfield a few laps ago on the Alexander Tauchnitzer Ferrari and is Marco Holzer going to do much the same thing here I think he could do because he's got a super run again on Leo they run bumper to bumper turning into Westfield again he's going to try and force that mistake from Federico Leo that we saw from Leo's driving partner Jimmy Bruni earlier on in the race he can't quite do it so they clamber over the curbs on the way into Sheen again Leo running a little bit out wide but he keeps it within the white lines 
and in towards Sterling. So where can Marco Holzer make that move? Again, he's going to try and set up Keith, probably for that run through clearways. And then towards Paddock Hill Bend as Nick Tandy looks on anxiously in the garage. This is big for Holzer. They're edging almost a second per lap off Kosnitsky in the lead, but it's not enough. If he stays behind Leo, they're not going to be able to take enough time out to make the lead on Brosnitsky and here comes Holzer now this is the move for second place he's looking down the inside of Leo as they head into Paddock Hill Bend in the Manthai Racing Porsche he takes to the inside is Leo going to cut him off he does and Holzer oversteers ever so slightly wide at the crest of Paddock Hill Bend they plunge down and they come up now into Druids Leo still holding on to second place they're only 12.4 seconds behind Brosnitsky but Holzer simply has to clear this Ferrari if he wants a chance of winning this race yeah, 17 and a half minutes to go then. And Federico there, I thought that was Holzer's, Holzer's opening there into Paddock Hill Bend. It didn't quite happen for him. So Marco Holzer, they accelerate on towards Surtees again. A potential overtaking opportunity here at Surtees. Particularly if Federico Leo takes the defensive line through Surtees. And that will slow him onto the run onto the Grand Prix loop. And again, they almost draw side by side the exit of Surtees. They accelerate towards Pilgrim's drop. A very quick section of the circuit this. And the Ferrari may just have the legs, but Holzer commits the outside line. It's Leo though who's got the inside for Hawthorns, but he's going to do well to keep that car from running out wide on the exit whereas Holzer takes the optimal racing line and Federico Leo is going to have to defend into Westfield as Holzer looks to draw alongside into Westfield they both turn but Holzer still can't force the opening then out over the curbs goes Federico Leo he's actually doing a very good job here of driving defensively keeping Marco Holzer at bay as they turn through Sheen on towards Sterling so again we're going to see the setup now out of Sterling's a slide in the car into Sterling's is Federico Leo much smoother is Marco Holzer he's going to be looking for that move into Paddock Hill Bend once more we've got the car that's gone through the gravel trap at Druids that is Nicky Pastorelli so 16 minutes left and what has that done to the lap times as well we'll find out in due course as accelerating along the Ram straight and Holzer again has got the run here on Federico Leo accelerating towards Paddock Hill Bend into the braking zone Leo covers the line and Holzer realizes he's not quite close enough instead though Leo still is a little bit wide through Paddock a big twitch from the AF course Ferrari climbing the hill towards Druids again the inside line in the hands of Federico Leo bobbing and weaving all over his tail is Marco Holzer there's no way through there and as a result on that last lap Michael Brozanitsky was quicker than this pair Leo now increasingly starting to take the touring car line out of Paddock Hill Bend and immediately pulling over to cover the inside at Druids. Here comes Holzer now having a look on the inside as they go into Sterling. Surtees and he goes through and into second place then Marco Holzer goes through and that was a long time coming. He got the run out of Graham Hill Bend and now Keith Holzer is through. Can he pull away and can he with 15 minutes in the race chase down Michael Brozanitsky? Another factor though to keep in mind for Holzer having made that excellent position, they, the team have had a warning that he must respect track limits. We've seen that here at Grand Hatch before. Drivers often running a little bit too wide at parts of the corner and the uh, race control will certainly have their eye on Holzer for that. But the important thing in for, him, for him now is he's clear on Federico Leo and he has to start cutting into the 12.8 second lead that Michael Brosnitsky has with quarter of an hour left to run in this race. He needs not far shy of two seconds lap as the Marco Mapelli has now been caught here by Alvaro Bob and Mapelli can almost afford to let him go because he comfortably leads the GTS class and so they're racing for overall race position but not class position so that is a good battle coming together as we take another look at the run that Holzer had on Federico Leo into Paddock Hill Bend some anxiety there in the Manti Racing Garage and here is the move and it was the textbook grand, Franz Hatch move really out of Graham Hill Bend, inside line into Surtees, and through went Marco Holzer. Righty, now we have completed the lap, and already Holzer was three tenths faster on that last lap than Michael Brosnitsky. Nick Tandy, a wry smile there in the garage. There is the race leader, Michael Brosnitsky. His advantage over Marco Holzer is 12.8 seconds, and that, I have to say, Keith, feels like it might just be enough. It, it is beginning to look insurmountable, I think, uh, for all that Holzer can throw at him. I think Brosnitsky might just have enough in hand already, but what we're going to have a look at now is the battle for third place, I think, between Federico Leo, which is developing. No, it's the battle for fifth. It's Marco Mapelli, Alvaro Barber, and Patrick Pile. So Pile, well, we were talking about this earlier in the race, Keith, that this car comes good in the closing stages, and he's now up on sale of Alvaro Barber. He could well snatch sixth position here and could yet still complete their amazing run of being in the top five in every race it, it's looking good he looks very very confident the car looks very stable even in these wet conditions he takes a big look up the inside as they come into druids trying to pass barber for that sixth place he's got the position and he's almost passing the other car of 
can't sorry, sorry, I can't see which car that is, but he's, he's very nearly passing him as well for the next position. Yes, yeah, Marco Mapelli. So Mapelli who leads the GTS class can afford to let Pile go if he really wants to. And this is probably the race of the year we've had thus far in the International GT Open because we have had battles throughout the field. And Mapelli gets it a little bit wrong into Surtees. He's very slow mid-corner, and that enables Pile to get right up onto his tail. You expect the Super GT Porsche to power past the GTS one as they plunge down Pilgrim's Drop and on towards Hawthorne's to the inside, and through he goes. So Patrick Pile is up into fifth position, and the team seem well set now to continue this run of top five finishes which with regards to their overall championship challenge is exactly what they're looking for it's an excellent lap from Pile taking off taking uh, two cars but he's not actually quick enough at the moment at least to catch Juan Manuel Lopez who is flying in fourth place we're beginning to talk about this a moment ago uh, he's reeling in Federico Leo for third place and it seems only a matter of time between those two who were separated by a second as this lap began will be contesting third position yeah the pair of them are running together on track we haven't seen it yet but they are having a very tight battle meanwhile Marco Holzer is not closing in on the race leader as we see now the change for sixth and it's Alvaro Barber who moves to the inside of Marco Mapelli. Mapelli looks to fight back as Brozanitsky has a little bit of a moment at Druid and now this could be very important he just skirts the gravel trap and I'd imagine that Michael Brozanitsky's blood pressure went sky high here's Juan Manuel Lopez on the tail then of Federico Leo this is the battle you're talking about Keith and Lopez a man possessed flashing the headlights um, Federico Leo having put up a stout defence to Marco Holzer for several laps is now going to hold on if he wants to be on the podium for another 11 and a half minutes. Yeah, the Argentinian driver has absolutely been flying over the last few laps. He's flashing the lights uh, as they come round to finish their 34th lap, and it does rather seem like only a matter of time before he puts a big move on Leo for that third place. Meanwhile, Holzer, you've got to say, even with that mistake by uh, Brosnitsky not making an enormous impact on their lead, we'll see what's happened as they come across the line now. Brosnitsky's done a 40.7. Holzer crosses line with a 30.38.8, taking the best part of two seconds out. He's ten and a half seconds behind, but even with 11 minutes to go, he's going to need perhaps a few more mistakes from Brosnitsky if he's going to overhaul that deficit. Yeah, I think uh, that's probably what he's going to need, and Brosnitsky does get it quite wrong through Graham Hill Bend on that occasion as we look on screen at the battle then for third and fourth position again Federico Leo sliding the car. Mind you, so does Juan Manuel Lopez. So here is the race leader, Michael Brosnitsky. Again, giving the curbs plenty of attention in terms of staying off them through Surtees. And Brozanitsky, all he needs to do is drive very smoothly. And Philip Petter will just be on the radio saying, just drive your own race, keep cool, keep smooth, and you will come through and win this race. And that, at the moment, is exactly what Michael Brozanitsky is doing. Again, a nice conservative line through Hawthorns, unlike these two, Federico Leo and Juan Manuel Lopez. And this is going to be tooth and nail over the remaining minutes of the race because Lopez closing on the tail of Leia but this is going to be much trickier really for one more Lopez to find his way through because with Marco Holzer Keith it was a Porsche it was a completely different car with different characteristics these are two Ferrari 458s and therefore where one more well, Lopez is strong around the circuit you probably expect Federico Leo to be able to withstand his challenge certainly and in fact the two probably not much more close than they were about a lap ago. Uh, Lopez continuing to stalk Leo as they come up round to complete another lap. Uh, meanwhile, up ahead, uh, Brozanitsky crosses the line with a 40.7, I think. Yes. Yeah, that seems a little bit... No, he's not. He's just crossed the line now, sorry, with a 40.0. I called that one a little bit too soon. Holes are continuing to edge him into 1.4 seconds out of that lap. The gap down to 9.1 seconds. Still not quite enough for Marco Holzer, but if Michael Brozanitsky were to make a slip, or just have a bit of an error. Now, the next concern for Brozniczki is he's beginning to get back into the traffic again. It's Alan Kalari, who's his next target. Is Leo again running very wide at Druids. Will he gather that up in time? Yes, he does. And the drivers throughout the course of today's race are taking advantage of the new concrete area at the hairpin at Druids that's new for the 2012 season. It means now that Juan Manuel Lopez is right under the rear spoiler hit of Federico Leo accelerating out of Graham Hill. We're going to see a carbon copy move to the inside. Looks Lopez. Leo tries to close the door, but Juan Manuel Lopez is going to force the issue here. He squeezes through. That's a brilliant move from Juan Manuel Lopez to snatch third position in the race. And so he goes through into third place with Federico Leo demoted to fourth. And we saw that coming. It was a an almost exact replay of the move from Marco Holzer except to say that Leo made that much more difficult for Lopez he really did Lopez was coming from quite a way back he didn't have much of an overlap as they went into that very very long radius corner but as they went in 
uh, Leo running a tad wide, and we see the replay here now. I mean, just look at that point even. He's not got that much of an overlap on the, uh, the Ferrari of Leo. They head into the corner. He's still quite a bit of a way back. Leo just gives him a little bit of space, and he takes all that he can, a little bit more, pushing him up onto the curve, completing a very neat move for third position. Right, so the race leader able to lap Alan Kalari at probably the optimal section of the circuit. So through goes Michael Brosnitsky. We wait for the lap time to update. It was a 1 minute 40.3. There is Philip Petter, who looks anxious. It was a 1 minute 38.4 from Michael Marco Holzer. 7.2 seconds with just under eight minutes remaining in the race. This is going to go all the way to the chequered flag as Planting his right foot there on the Exeter Druids is Michael Brosnitsky as he just slides the rear of that car. He is pushing very, very hard here. Brosnitsky. And th this is where the risk starts to creep in. You can see those last three laps, 1.9, 1.3, 1.8. Marco Holzer is turning up the screw at the, the perfect moment of the race. We've got a drive-through penalty for the number 56 car of Andrea Rizzoli, and that's for not... Uh, respecting their pit stop handicap following the result from the second race at Spa. So they've got the drive-through penalty. That is going to potentially promote Andrea Cecalero up to third in the GTS class. Should certainly pr promote Daniel Zampieri up second in class. So here are the two leaders then as they come out of Hawthorne and in towards Westfield. Seven minutes exactly remaining in the race, climbing through Dingle Dell. And this could almost come down, Key, to actually how much time is left on the clock going into the final lap of the race for uh, Michael Brosnitsky. Exactly, it's going to be a crucial question of when they cut the beam and also how quickly uh, and how safely Holzer can clear this lap traffic above, but perhaps, uh, like, I'm sorry, when we see the uh, car coming out, this just served its drive-through penalty. Yeah, Andrea Rizzoli. Rizzoli. Yeah, so Rizzoli will, he may have actually held on to, uh, yeah, he's held on to third in the GTS class as through then Completing the lap is Michael Brosnitsky. Oh, and he's up to his pace. A so 1 minute 39.8. So Brosnitsky turns up the screw, but so does Marco Holzer. 6.2 seconds, the gap between the pair of them with six minutes remaining. It now needs to be a second a minute, not a second a lap for Marco Holzer. Philip Petter just uh, chewing on the straw. And there's now nothing but empty asphalt between the leaders as well. So it's really the length of circuit between Graham Hill Bend and Druids between first and second place as the track so just beginning on the Indy circuit to dry out a little bit. So it's going to come down possibly to just how ambitious Marco Holzer wants to be with regards to some of the lines here. And also of that leading group, the driver we haven't talked about here, Keith, but is the fastest is Juan Manuel Lopez, who is a good half a second quicker than Marco Holzer. There he is in third place, and he's closing in on two leaders as well. Yeah, you rather get the sense that the, the top three are all closing together and they're, they're just going to catch each other on the final lap, but there's, uh, there's not going to be an awful lot in it. And as you say, as these laps tick down, they'll, uh, they'll cross the line and it will be a question of how many times now they can cross the finishing line in the final remaining five minutes. It's looking like we're going to get something in the region of three or four laps. And, uh, and that will be the critical question of whether that's enough. Um, for Holzer to take two seconds per lap out of Brosnitsky or Lopez needing in the region of about a second per lap to catch Holzer but only getting half a second so far. Meanwhile, we watch uh, Lopez uh, picking his way past some more lap traffic uh, as they come round to begin another lap. Brosnitsky just approaching our position now as I talk to you and uh, Lopez flashing the lights on his Ferrari 458 as he pulls away uh, from the lapped number 51 car of Alan Kalari. Yeah, and he's caught Alan Kalari, unfortunately, at one of the worst possible points in the circuit so it's a 1 minute 39.4 for Michael Brosnitsky a 1 minute 38.4 for Marco Holzer 5.2 seconds the gap between the pair of them the chase is on the next car in their sight is going to be Andrea Rizzoli who has served his drive through penalty and uh, that puts him into uh, 12th positional there thereabouts so he's third in the GTS class so Brosnitsky really is now getting to the territory of not making a mistake and if he's able to do that he may just have enough time here to claim his maiden victory of the season fingers crossed in the Kessel Racing pit they are uh, they're, they're smiling they enjoy their racing the Kessel Racing team and this is why they go racing because the moments like this when they've got the car in a winning position with a gap that they think is probably just about manageable and this has been also superb drive from Michael Brosnitsky because the team have said you need to up your pace He's been able to do that. He's responded, although Marco Holzer is still chasing. But there you can see that that chase has levelled off. 1.8 seconds. It could have been real jeopardy time for Michael Brosnitsky. One second a lap. It may just be 
enough as he comes down. It's going to be about three minutes and 10 seconds left on the clock going into what therefore would be the penultimate lap of the race. Yes, it looks like we might just get two more laps now. That would really play into Brosnitsky's hands. I mean, he wants as few laps as possible at this stage when he's losing around about a second lap to Holzer. But it does look like it's not going to be quite enough for Holzer to make it, although he's going to push him around every single millimetre of this 3.7 kilometre Brands Hatch circuit. They cross line in front of us. The gap now down to 4.3 seconds. Holzer actually took less than a second out of Brosnitsky uh, on that lap. Brosnitsky doing a, a superb job, particularly when you consider he made that crucial mistake a few laps ago. He ran wide, and that can really play on the driver's mind. You can tense up with the wheel. You can start to not take so many chances. And for a lap or two, it seemed like that had happened. He was losing up to two seconds per lap. But he's really got the hammer down now. He's not. He's stemmed the tide, if you like, to Holzer. I know we can see that lurid, bright yellow and green car growing larger in his mirrors lap after lap with the spray subsiding behind him. It's starting to look as though he's going to be able to get the job done. I'll tell you what, the GTS battle's not done yet, is it? Because Marco Mapelli is being caught hand over fist here by a charging Daniel Zampieri. He's got a couple of the Super GT cars between them, but what, what it means is Mapelli cannot afford to make a mistake here. So Zampieri, he's in 11th place. He's chasing down the 10th place car at the moment of Nicky Pastorelli. And that is a battle for overall race position as we're into the final two minutes of the race and Zampieri <laughs> drives only as he knows how, which is on the limit every lap. And Marco Mapelli though, should just have enough. Mapelli is through. He leads the GTS class second in class then is Daniel Zampieri, who thought he would fly after taking over from Michael Dallastella, and that is exactly what he has done. So, Brosnitsky leading, and is this going to start the final lap of the race? It is going to start the final lap of the race because we've got 90 seconds left on the clock, and they're lapping in the region of 1 minute 39. So, Brosnitsky then about to start the final lap of the race and en route to claim his and Philip Petter's first win of the season, potentially, and it was a 1 minute. 40.3 though from Brozanitsky. 2.7 seconds is advantage over Marco Holzer. This is not done yet because the slightest error from Brozanitsky and Holzer is going to be all over his tail. Turning through Druids then and Brozanitsky here, Keith, you made the point a moment ago, he cannot afford to be tentative. He's got to drive this lap almost like a qualifying lap. Nope, there will be no uh, slowing down and waving to the crowd on this time by, and as they come past our position, you can see the gap shrinking before your eyes. Just 2.7 seconds as they head out into the countryside for the final time. And we wonder if they will still be in the same same order when they come back to where we can see them. But Brosnitsky, so far, oversteering a little bit as he comes out of the exit of Surtees and climbs back to go down. Pilgrims drop for the final time. So half a lap to go then here in the seventh race of the 2012 International GT Open and what a race it has been. This has been really the race of the year thus far, a wet but dry race and Holzer is closing in onto the tail of Brosnitsky. Brosnitsky just running a little bit wide through Westwood. He's out over the curves. It's not going to cost him more than a tenth or so and that he can afford. The clock 15 seconds left on it as out of Sheen then for the final time into Sterling's comes Michael Brosnitsky. This is really one of the last challenges on the course, the left-hander. He negotiates it absolutely perfectly, accelerating then in towards the final turn at clearways. The clock has ticked to zero. The chequered flag is being readied. And is it going to be a win here for Michael Brosnitsky? And Philip Petri turns through clearways then for the final time and accelerates along the Brabham Strait. And Michael Brosnitsky is going to do it here to the delight of the Kessel Racing team. It's Michael Brosnitsky and Philip Petter who win round seven of the season from Marco Holzer. And Nick Tandy in second position. Juan Manuel Lopez and Andrea Montermini take third. The Kessel Racing team are absolutely jubilant. And let's not forget that two hours before this race started, Michael Brosnitsky's car, which has just won the race, was wedged against the pit barrier here on the Brabham Strait after a size accident in qualifying. The team have worked wonders to get that car ready for the race. And for Michael Brosnitsky, for Philip Petter to keep the head has been very good. Now we've got this battle going on for 7th, 8th and 9th because Marco Mapelli has got Alexander Tamkinitsa Jr. and Raffaele Giamaria right on his tail. So the fighting continues all the way through to the flag and this would give the GTS class victory to Marco Mapelli and Archie Hamilton. Are they going to be able to hold on to it? It's then Zampieri in second, Andrea Cecalero up to third in the class after Rizzoli really struggled in the closing stages. They accelerate then out of Sterling to the final time. Are we going to see the move from Giamaria? He's certainly lining up Alexander Tamkinitsa for that but I don't think he's going to be quite able to, to do it so accelerating then out of clearways along through Clark Curve and on to claim seventh position and win the GTS class is Marco Mapelli in the car he shares with Archie Hamilton with Alexander Tauconitsa Jr a very very fine eighth position Raphael Giamaria 
completing the top 10. And that key was a super race. That was I mean, absolutely entertainment for every single lap of the race. Never a, a dull moment. And you have to say, uh, Brosnitsky will be very, very happy that as he came out of Sterling's for the last time, the clock ticked down to zero and he did not have to complete another lap because when he crossed the line, he was just one second ahead of Nick Tandy. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think another lap, it, it could have been Marco Holzer's win. As it was, this is how the classification looks like with the win for Michael Brosnitsky and Philip Petter. Second place to Marco Holzer and Nick Tandy. Third place, Andrea Montermi and Juan Manuel Lopez. Federico Leo and Jimmy Bruni in fourth. Ramon the Rack and Patrick Pile continue their run of top five finishes in fifth with Alvaro Barra and Matteo Malicelli completing the top six. Marco Mapelli, and Archie Hamilton winning the GTS class from... Daniel Zampieri and Michael Dallastella in 11th. Then Massimo Mantovani and Andrea Cecalero in excellent third in the GTS class. They will be very, very pleased with that. Again, a race with a very low casualty rate. Just Freddie Kramer's spin at Graham Hill Bend. And Michele Rugolo, the innocent victim of overambition from Alexander Taukonitsa at Druids in the early stages. The crowd here at Brands Hatch, they may have got drenched, but they have been treated to an absolutely brilliant race from the International GT Open, which, of course, is back tomorrow so do join us on the live web stream www.live.gtopen.net where you'll be able to watch the eighth race of the season which takes us through to the halfway point of the year that gets underway at 12 15 local time tomorrow so please do join us for that in the meantime if you've got any questions for keith and myself overnight that you'd like us to put to the drivers then do tweet us to at keith Collentine or at ben commentator and we'll be able to get you all the information from the paddock overnight so smiles all around as you would absolutely expect from Michael Brosnitsky. I think Marco Holzer as well. Shaking hands with Alfredo, the head of communications from GT Sport and posing for photos because that is what GT racing is all about. It's about the chase and it's about very clean, close, competitive multi-mark racing. Absolutely, yeah. And a, a, a fantastic race there. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Juan Manuel Lopez, third place in the uh, Valorba Ferrari. I think they may regret whatever problem befell uh, Andrea Montermini early on in the race that unfortunately we didn't see uh, when they were running away with the lead of this one. Uh, they finished just five seconds behind Brosnitsky and without whatever problem it was they had, they would surely have been in contention for the uh, victory. But as it is, uh, on the podium once again. Yeah, and waves the camera, smiles all around. It, it's one of those races where everybody has just been glad to get to the chequered flag. And it's such a friendly paddock here in the International GT Open. All the drivers eat in the other team's hospitality tents over the course of the weekend. That They're always talking to each other, always shaking hands with each other. And because it's such a friendly championship, it is a reason why it, it thrives and is so successful. It also means that you don't get immediately after the race, then the acrimony, you get the handshakes, you get the smiles, you get the posing for the photos, and it, it shows the drivers really enjoying themselves here at Brands Hatch today, where they've negotiated tough conditions, given us some fantastic entertainment. And I think a word on the sheer quality of the driving we've had as well. I mean, we've had here a very, very wet race, which then got even wetter, um, and yet we've not had any safety car periods, we've not had any particularly big shunts, obviously there wasn't a few cars had uh, had minor spins, but on such a challenging circuit like Brands Hatch, to get through a 70 minute race with no major interruptions like that, I think I think speaks to the quality of uh, a lot of the driving. I mean, we talk about the professional versus the, the gentleman drivers, but really all of the driving in this series that I saw today was of a very high standard. It, it really was, particularly as we saw the drivers on the absolute limit. I think it's probably only Michele Rugolo who will look back on this one with a little bit of disappointment because he would have felt that that car was well poised to be on the GTS podium, which we will go to very, very shortly as the drivers get to stand on the legendary podium here at Brands Hatch. As we take a look at uh, the Drivers' Championship, and it's Nick Tandy and Marco Holes then who move into the lead of the standings from Patrick Pile and Ramon the Rack. Again, the consistency from Alvaro Barber. Matteo Melicelli, Philip Petto, Michael Brosnitsky, so they are all on 68 points. So Petro and Brosnitsky really driving themselves up to uh, effectively be third in the championship standings because of the, the driver pairings element to it. More points for Leo and Bruni as they are in ninth and tenth position. It shows how competitive this championship is that we've got so many drivers that have been racking up the points over the course of the season. Mapelli and Hamilton improve their position in the standings. So they move up into 16th and 17th respectively, and that has been a very fine performance from the Autolando Sport Porsche team. Well, tomorrow's race brings us to the halfway point of the championship from there. Next weekend, we're at Paul Ricard before we head to the Hungaro Ring, Monza, and then the season finishing 
at Barcelona in November. There is Philip Petter smiling for the cameras. Marco Holzer and Nick Tandy as well. It's always a wonderful atmosphere, I think, Keith, but behind the podium after a race like this with the drivers all smiles that they know that they have, have been on the limit and that they have done really exactly what their job description is. Racing drivers like winning, and these guys have done just that. And, and what a better venue for it as well. I mean, this is an absolutely fabulous circuit. It, it's a pity that we don't really see more racing uh, going on on this track, but it's such a, such a fast flowing, picturesque and scenic venue. It's always fantastic to, to come to Brands Hatch and see some racing on the, uh, on the old school Grand Prix track. And I know, well, I'm quite certain that every single one of the drivers will, uh, will enjoy that. And they get to race at some brilliant tracks. I mean, these guys have just come from Spa Francorchamps. They've already raced at the Nürburgring. Um, they had a race, obviously, at the very nice new facility uh, in Portugal. But this really one of the great classic motor racing venues. It, it really is, and it, it's one of, one of the attractions of the International GT Open is they always try to put together a calendar of spectacular circuits that are very, very attractive to the drivers. So unfortunately, <coughs> the recovery work continuing for the car of Michele Rugolo, but they will be back tomorrow because tomorrow it is the slightly shorter 50-minute race. As we were saying a few moments ago, it gets underway at 12.15 British Summer Time, and you can join us on the live web stream, live.gtopen.net, where you'll be able to watch all of the action in full HD. And spectators, here at Brands Hatch, there's a few more races on the programme at Brands Hatch today, not least the European F3 Open that is coming up very shortly. And again, if you stay tuned to the web stream, then that gets underway at around about half past four. So 20 minutes time for round seven of the European F3 Open. In the meantime, as Michele Rugolo's car is recovered from the gravel trap of Druids. We are about to get underway with the podium presentations here at Brands Hatch with smiles and handshakes all around. And it's going to be a very jubilant podium, this one. Just waiting for the drivers just to be announced out. Well, it's not quite the weather for ice cream here, but nonetheless, some of the spectators taking the gamble. You've got to make what you can out of the British summer, and I think the, the spectators here have done a very good job. Yeah, absolutely. So Andrea Montermedy and Juan Manuel Lopez then on to the third rung of the rostrum. Second place, the new championship leaders, Marco Holzer and Nick Tandy. Super performance from the pair of them. And then our race winners, Michael Brosnitsky and Philip Petter. Top step of the rostrum, handshakes and high fives. And then Kessel Racing, the winning team. Swiss National Anthem then in honour of Kessel Racing, the winning team. And now the, the main race of the day completed the second one about to start, which is going to be the one for the Champagne Cork. First of all, we've got the presentation of the trophies. On a, a, a very crowded but jubilant podium here. So first of all, the third place trophies. Then it's David Scott, who is the uh, event director here for this uh, weekend's meeting at Brands Hatch. He's also the, the chief steward for the FAA Formula 2 Championship and, and worked very, very hard to run so many of the national and international meetings that we have here in the UK. And then it's uh, Mike Scott, the circuit manager here at Brands Hatch, who presents the winner's trophies to Philip Petter and Michael Brosnitsky. And then we have got as well the presentation from Fidus Avari from Dunlop 
to the winning team, Kessel Racing, who hoist that aloft and celebrate. Right, race one done, race two underway. And that's the sign of experience, Andrea Monturmini, first off the mark with the champagne court, quickly followed by Philip Petter. Well, he's had plenty of uh, experience, uh, certainly in this championship and in plenty of other series as well, Andrea Monturmini. And uh, yeah, and the Kessel Racing Boys absolutely loving this. They really are. So Marco Holzer and Nick Tandy enjoying the champagne on the podium. They've also got these little woolen dolls this weekend that have been made in their image as we take a look at some super slow motion shots of the race winning car in full flight there. We talked about it briefly in the race, Keith, the, the repairs following the incident that happened in qualifying, which we, we didn't catch on camera, but as I say, was only a couple of hours but before this race got underway. A wonderful job from the Kessel Racing team. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's evidence of teamwork carried around on the car every lap of the race. You can see the effort that's gone into uh, getting that car on the grid and uh, a, a superb driving effort by, uh, by both uh, Petter and uh, Brosnitsky. Yeah, I think Michael Brosnitsky in particular deserves a very special mention because Philip Petter, we, we know mm -hmm. how quick he is, we know how experienced he is to actually withstand <laughs> the challenge of a driver like Marco Holzer who is bringing that gap down lap after lap I in that way really is a, a very, very fine performance. But that also rather takes for granted the, the pace of Marco Holzer because it's no mean feat mm. to, to carve out one and a half seconds a lap over what is a relatively short lap here at Brands Hatch in comparison to the length of uh, the lap of some of the circuits we visit with the International GT Open. Exactly. I mean, it's so hard to teach someone to so how to soak up that kind of pressure. I mean, you, you can talk as much as you like about mind management, but once you're there in the car and you've got you know, a very competitive, very experienced, uh, very successful driver bearing down on you, um, then it comes down to what you do at the wheel and you know how you how you manipulate the controls how you drive the lap and how you keep your head in gear and uh, and Brosnitsky yeah Holzer was bearing down on him but he got his lap times down and he stayed ahead so now it's the GTS podium and well my management I think comes fully into play here with Archie Hamilton because he has been working very hard with his training to get himself in the right frame of mind for this weekend and it has worked and he is delighted as well onto the top step of the rostrum alongside Marco Mapelli in second place then Michael Dallastella and Daniel Zampieri with Massimo Mantovani and Andrea Cecalero completing the podium. That's a really fun performance for Mantovani and Cecalero and they are the first to receive their trophies once more. So uh, Auto Orlando Sport as well arriving onto the podium to uh, take their team winner's trophy. Big thumbs up there. David Scott once more doing the uh, honours with uh, the uh, second place trophies. And then we will get the winner's trophies for Mapelli and Hamilton, who, after having had a very strong start to the year at Force Mile, they really have come together very, very nicely here at Brands Hatch this weekend. North Orlando Sport as well will be... Uh, delighted with that victory they're not a flashy team auto Orlando sport every penny that that team spends goes into the car you won't find a hospitality unit there you won't find anything beyond some sandwiches and some biscuits but you will find the latest trick bit to make a GTS Porsche go very very quickly which is exactly what it's done this weekend at Brands Hatch so again the champagne fight begins on the podium with uh, Hamilton and uh, Mapelli uh, thoroughly enjoying that Archie Hamilton now we gets the champagne uncorked as we take a look then at the highlights of the race. It was Andrea Montermini who's set off for the early advantage with Nick Tandy though pressurizing him around the outside through Paddock Hill Bend. He couldn't quite make that move and it was Montermini who led all the way in the early stages with in hot pursuit Jimmy Bruni. The track started wet but drying. The rain then really came down as we had the adventures through the field. Iraj Alexander one of the early spinners and Michael Dallastella when he sees that tonight, he realised just how lucky he was to get onto the podium. Then the rain came down. This prompted some over-ambition. Michele Rugolo, unfortunately, pushed out of the race following that slight mistake from Alexander Stalkanitsa. The driver changes came around. Nick Tandy was in the lead by that stage. He handed over to Marco Holzer. But it was after the pit stops, the number 11 car of Philip Petter and Michael Brosnitsky that was able to come through into the lead with Petter. Having done the hard work staying out there, Federico Leo took over from Jimmy Bruni. So Petter late into the pit lane with Michael Brosnitsky then taking over an additional 15 seconds in the pit stop for Marco Holzer. Result of the Spa victory fed that number 11 Porsche out into the lead, number 11 Ferrari rather, out into the lead of the race, which 
which is where it stayed. We saw then a brilliant battle for second and third position with Federico Leo under real pressure from Marco Holzer. Eventually, after several laps of concerted pressure, Holzer wasn't able to force his way through at Paddock Hill Bend despite his very best efforts. Instead, that move came here on the exit of Graham Hill Bend and he was able to draw alongside into Surtees, into second, thus beginning the chase of the race on to the race leader, Brosnitsky. We then saw a carbon copy of the move as Juan Manuel Lopez forced his way through on Federico Leo to move up into third position to give us a podium of Brosnitsky. The winner, second place, Marco Holzer, and then third place, Juan Manuel Lopez. It was a brilliant race for an international GT Open with the GTS class being claimed by Marco Mapelli and Archie Hamilton. So we will be back at 12.15 tomorrow for round eight of the season. Until then, from myself and Evans and Keith Collatine alongside me, it's time to say goodbye, and we look forward to you joining us very, very soon.